Okay, the first picture we're looking at is a, um, a gypsy moth on Edo um, I-35 float. It's a very old airplane, and I'm not exactly sure when this was done, but I think it was done in the late 20s. Um, it's interesting to see it, and uh, you might want to comment, Dave, how fast that thing's going on the water right now and why that's happening. <laughs> well, J.J., when we got the film, I think it was shot at 16 frames, and when we transferred it, we transferred it at 24 frames, so everything speeded up. And we didn't have the ability to slow it down at the time. I transferred it back in the in the 70s or 80s. Well, we're very lucky to even get this footage. You can see how old it is and the shape of it and stuff. Um, well, you know, when, when we transferred it, I put it onto a uh, one-inch broadcast tape, and there aren't any machines that will play it back anymore. So fortunately, I made a VHS copy. And that's one of the reasons the resolution is so soft, because we're taking this from a VHS tape. This next picture is very nice. It's the Granville GB. And when everybody thinks of the GB, they think of the GB racer that went on to um, become quite famous and flown by Jimmy Doolittle in the Cleveland Air Races. Um, I don't know much about this aircraft, but it's very interesting to see it, and it's certainly nice to have this footage. And the Granville brothers were very famous for what they did in, in racing and high-speed airplanes. You ought to note on this, too, that all these early pictures have no water rudders. At well, that point, Ito had not developed or invented the water rudder. I was that going to ask, that's the reason it wasn't invented. I noticed it that. It was invented. Nobody had it, and one of the reasons he selected the plant is he had three directions of wind, so he could go work without it. Uh, the Aviat is a British-built airplane that I'm not familiar with, and uh, the more interesting part of this uh, shot, when you see it, is note the ferry in the background. You'll see the ferry, and Edo built its plant next to the ferry, and this was all done before the Whitestone Bridge that was built started in 1937 and completed in 1940. And the minute you'll see the ferry go by, and in a lot of the future shots, you'll see better shots of the ferry. Well, that looks so like the, that looks was the only way to get from the Bronx. And the ferry was, um, the Whitestone Bridge was put in by Robert Moses so he could get better attendance at the um, at the World's 1939 World's Fair. Boy, that's in, what's in the background there now? And you see the smoke going by, that's the ferry. And we have a lot better ferry shots. And the ferry slip later became the slip where the eagle used to keep its big sonar pipe barge. Now, I th think in some place, some of these clips are repeated. Uh, right, and that gets quite a ways in before we see that, and we'll kind of skip over. Uh, the monocoupe is a Lambert monocoupe with a 90 horsepower, and it has an H1525 float. And later there was a Model 47 1965. These are relatively obscure airplanes that there are not many left today, and I don't think any of these are left on floats, which is kind of too bad. In the background on some of these shots, you'll see that South Beach Airport that later came on, went on to become LaGuardia Airport. You'll see some big hangars in the background. I'm not sure which pictures is in, but as you look further on, you'll be able to see those. Well, wasn't Edo over there for a while? Edo never went there because the road was so bad. The road was so bad in there, they figured they couldn't haul anything in there. This is a Waco F with a Warner Scob engine, and uh, it's a 125 horsepower engine. And one thing to note: notice the spreaders are just a bar strapped onto the top of the float. This one's on an L2260 float, and it was later put on a 442425 float. The Edo went through the alphabet three times, and it doesn't mean we built a float model. We thought about it, but we never did it. In some cases. But that's what all these, um, any of the L floats or any of the letter floats are very, very, that's something you don't see anymore. That's basically in the LaGuardia control zone, the guy's doing a loop with a seaplane. <laughs> Jeez. Which is, which is very interesting. Now, when you get all these tests going on out in front of Edo, uh, College Point, do you ever have what you call a rescue boat available to get these guys out? You never so see. we had a rescue boat in the early days. All we had was a little, um, a little rowboat there that would get back and forth from a buoy they had. But later on, we actually went to a quite an elaborate rescue boat, and we did some of the more exotic work on the Grumman um, Goose and the Grumman Widgeon and some of the hydrofoil work that we did. Um, that was the original Edo logo, and that was based on a flying fish in um, in Hawaii. And it's interesting to see that even today uh, we have equipped more airplanes, more airplanes with floats than any other manufacturer. Uh, the Consolidated Fleet was both on a single float for the Navy, and then and it also had a Warner Scab, hundred or one hundred twenty-five horsepower engine. 
and again, it was on the 47, uh, 1965 float. And again, if you'll note in these pictures, there's no water rudder on any of these things. So it's kind of interesting that the people did that well in maneuvering these things and didn't do more float damage. Um, well, says, look at the small tail on there. Yeah, I'm surprised it's, it's they could a small turn. Small tail, and I don't think the F, I don't think the CAA or whatever they're doing at that time was as touchy on certification. This Travel Air SE 4000 has got a five-cylinder right in it, and it was 165 right. or 175 horsepower. In this picture again, you notice the spreaders are on top of the float, and that's an M2665 float. And we later certified that also on a 45-2880 float which was quite a common float and was even used on some very early 180s. Um, now, that's the boat in the background there? The, the boat in the background. There was a boat in there. But the, the ferry is a big... See the ferry there? There's a big ferry in there. Yeah, I saw that. It just went by. Now we're landing now. But there's some better pictures. As we go on, you'll see it. The and now Curtis the Curtis... Challenger Robin was a Model C1 and had a Challenger engine and 185 horsepower engine which was quite a lot of horsepower for that day. And that was on a P-3300 float and later installed on a 45-2880 float. Now, as we go along, to make sure we're in sync, I'll let you know when the next title comes up. Okay, the Challenger Air, which sync, is the okay. travel air. title came up. Yeah, and that's a WA-4665 float. and had a rather large engine for a time. I believe it had a right... 300 horsepower engine in it, which was pretty big. And if you notice there on the side of that airplane, it says Edo Float Service. And I think Edo was running a training school and hopping some rides in the spare time. Edo, you mean Edo Seaplane Service? Edo Seaplane Service. Yeah. That's what that was about. How much of a tide change was there at that dock? There is about, there's about eight feet, and it's, uh, you know, it's considerably enough. And you can notice this long ramp there. And that was to try to keep the angle down on the ramp because the ramp was quite dangerous. It was so, it was so steep. This is a rear wind uh, Steelman, and it, and it's um, I best guess I think it's a three B three Steelman. I'm sorry on that. And it was um, it was on an Edo P thirty three hundred float again, an early float with no water rudders. It says American Air on the airplane. Who was that? I don't know who that is. It meant nothing to me, and it you know it's. Again, this is, most of these pictures were taken even before I was born, and I'm getting pretty old. So <laughs> it's, it's, uh, it's fun to have these, and it's really nice to have, have this. Now, how many films ended up in the trash bin that we didn't get a chance to a copy? Lot of the, a lot of this early stuff, which was too bad, nobody had any appreciation for it at all. Okay, they were on the, on the WACO SCO. What does the SCO stand for? Uh, CSO, that was their internal model number. And I want to, before we get into this too much, keep your eyes open because this has some very good ferry shots in it, if I remember correctly. And again, another airplane with no water rudders. This is a, a right seven cylinder J6, 250 horsepower. And it again was on one of the letter floats. If you notice, the rudders are on the top and there are no water rudders. And that was an M665. And then on an Edo 45-2880 float that was quite a popular float. Now keep watching here in a minute, and you'll get a good ferry shot, and you realize that all traffic from the Bronx to Long Island was handled on these ferries that went back and forth between the two places. And you'll see a good shot, I think, right about now. At least yep. There's the ferry. You see the ferry in the background there? And that was really that's the only. I think the ferry was very cheap then. I think it was like a quarter or something was all to put your car on. But I assume the population was somewhat And the population less. was greatly reduced, I believe. <laughs> and the bridge didn't really start until 19, 1940, or 1939, I guess, because Moses was determined to get the world, make, it, make the world's fair population grow. The Ryan B-7 was equipped, and the B-7 was on a Pratt and & Whitney, and, and, or a, a Wasp, and it, it had a 420 horsepower. And it was on a rather large float. It was on a K... Um, a K... 4650 float, and you notice the strut configuration. It's a very interesting strut configuration that you certainly don't see uh, as an interesting way to take the loads out of the float and put them into the fuselage. You don't see that very much anymore. I notice the tip of the floats are not rounded. They're kind of sharp. Yeah, I don't know. They, they um, I guess they didn't really weren't doing a great amount of um, 
metal bending in those days. They weren't using heat treats on the bottom. All these floats we're looking at here do have the Edel compound bottom, which was at that time was patented, two by Edel. Uh, we're now looking at a Blanca pacemaker. We're starting to get in some of the larger floats. And this float was on a right J6 with a 300 horsepower. And it also used a Pratt and Whitney Wasp Jr. engine. And it had a 300 horsepower. And again, we had it on a K4650 float. And then on a Y5280 float, I suspect as the horsepower went up, we went into went to a larger float. Now, when these get on the water, I mean, how did they turn without the water rudder? They used just the air water, and if they had a lot of air, they couldn't really, you know, turn it out of the air. So I take your, you know, if you got your 172 and you had your water rudders up, you know, and you can't turn it around, you suddenly realize you're doing something wrong. So you put the water rudders down. But it's interesting to see if you notice they're, they're using a lot of air rudder to do this. This Lockheed Vega is an interesting airplane, uh, and, and they, I think the spell they got the Lockhead, and I'm pretty sure that should read Lockheed uh, Vega, and it was on a model. It's a model five or six with a Pratt & Whitney Wasp 4, 450 or 450, 420 or 450, and that's on a K4650 float. And uh, this this little this little travel, this Wasp Travel Air monoplane was from Canada. It looks to me like they brought it down to Edo, put the floats on, and what would happen is the CAA inspector would come out and the floats would be certified under the aircraft type data sheet in most cases. Uh, <coughs> and look at the inertial starter. It's kind of interesting to see this. Some flywheel. And you basically have a big flywheel. You're absolutely right, Dave. You get it up to speed. And then, um, you know, once you got it going, you engaged it and off it went. It had a Pratt Whitney Wasp 450. And this, again, was on a YA float with a, 60, a 6235 float. Interesting struts going up to the top of the very wing. interesting strut. Uh, this is a new factory, and it is, you know, Edo started in 19, Edo started originally in 1925, um, 20, and this is only four years after it was completed. You get an idea, you're talking before about the high, the tide, you can see how much, and that was a very dangerous ramp, ramp. We had a bunch of accidents on it, and you can't see it in any of the pictures, but the guys actually had little spikes on the bottom of their shoes, huh. they, and they would put that to work on that ramp, and you can imagine it would get slippery and greasy as a as a bear. This is a very interesting shot. This is the down at Wall Street, and this is the, the ramp that was built in, in 19, uh, 1920, 1938, I think. No, it was built built in the early 30s. And that's a Blanca, uh, that's an interesting aircraft. That's a Blanca air cruiser on there. That's a big airplane. That's 12,700 pounds floats on that. And if you'll notice, you'll see eight people getting out of this aircraft. Now the ramp turned around. And the air, and it goes up on the ramp, and it was air-driven, and it would turn around. And we had things as large as the Ford Trimotor you'll see in here later. And um, that that airplane, I think, might have been owned by Tommy Hitchcock, the player. He had one of those, and he stationed it in, in Port Washington, New York. This is a Blanca Air Cruiser, I believe. And, um, again, certainly the, the 16... 16 frames a second certainly make these things look like they're moving very fast. <laughs> I've never seen any turning ramp like that in the past. No one's ever... And, and the hurricane of 1938 took it out, and they decided it was too expensive to rebuild and put back in again. So it's kind of it's kind of too bad that it disappeared because it made it awful convenient. You just drive the airplane up, and some of those airplanes were pretty big. Ford Trimotor went up to almost 14,000 pounds, and we have some... Rather good footage of the Ford Trimotor coming up a little, a little later. Now, that's a good ferry shot right there. You can see the ferry going into the ferry slip at College Point. Now, when Ida was sold, wasn't a lot of this film thrown out or something? It was thrown out even before. Nobody had any interest in it. And as Ida went through downscale, we had a free man photography. They event free man photography department, and as they completely eliminated the, the department, they just threw this stuff out. It was, you know, in little cans and laying all over the thing. And again, Dave, I wish to thank you for being the guy that, um, you know, was able to take this stuff. And I think at that point, I'm not sure you're even supposed to have cellulose film in New York City, where you? <laughs> Maybe we don't discuss that. <laughs> well, that, that that was called uh, not cellulose. It was called, oh, not nitrogen, but uh, nitrate. Nitrate film. No, this was this was all 16. It was and all I, 16. I would stay late after work to transfer this before I went home, and that's how we got it transferred. Right. 
and it's very flammable. And I guess somebody told me they weren't allowed to transfer it in New York City at one time. Well, yeah, nitrate. We had nitrate film, and we brought it outside in the street and set a match to it. It, it burned, but it wasn't like gasoline. Explosion, huh? It, it, but the powder was very flammable. But, let me interrupt you for a minute, because this is very interesting. This is an Aronka um, C3, which had a D960 float. Notice there's only about six or seven guys carrying it. And had a 36 or 40, 36 or 40 horsepower engine. <coughs> and I've been told it was the only airplane that Edo ever put on floats that went faster on floats than it did on wheels. It had the the effect of the Polaris ships, and I did. And I think it did 40 or 36 miles an hour on the air, and it did 37 miles an hour on floats. It's some unbelievably low number, but it's interesting to see that. And I have um, I've never seen one on floats. Uh, John Brown's father, Jack Brown, gave me a ride in one on wheels. It's the only time I've ever been in one. It was a great thrill in my life to be able to do that. These are some assorted airplanes. Some of them we've, we've looked at before and some we haven't. If anybody can specifically identify something that's in here that we haven't picked up, we'd like to hear from them, and we will add and go back and correct what we don't have modified here. And again, there's the ferry going out of the slip, which is... Well, he was close to your place, wasn't he? Pardon? He was close to your place. Yeah, he oh he was he was right there, and that slip is where we eventually put our crash boat in there, and that crash boat rescued a lot of people in one of the uh, one of the accidents in the 1960s at LaGuardia Airport. I think we picked up 36 or 37 survivors out of the water. Well, now I see water rudders. Yeah, now we're getting, and you can see that's a 34th, that's a 38, 34, 30 float, and we the spreader arrangement has now gone through the float, and this was invented in the mid 30s. I don't know what model airplane that is, and if someone can identify that, we'd appreciate that. And just to see how that terrain and that country has all changed, too. One of the big changes was, you know, the Whitestone Bridge was built on the same design as the Tacoma's Narrows Bridge, which became the famous Galloping Gertie, Gertie Bridge. And there's a lot of footage around that thing. And in the, in the early 40s, they went back and put a whole reinforcement section in it so the airplane would not oscillate like the Tacoma's Bridge. And if you look at late, later pictures of the um, thing, you'll see the difference in there. What is this? I don't know. I hate to admit I've got to spend some time and look it up. Some of the, well, this is a very interesting float. This is a, a beach stagger wing. I understand it was, a, considering that was a very hot-performing airplane, it was owned by most of the wealthy sportsman stuff in the late 30s, and this is either on the 38 or uh, 3430 or the 39 4000. It looks like the ramp is turning around. And, and that's down That's down on Wall Street again. Okay. Back at Wall Street. And that's got a Pratt & Whitney or, or a Jake engine, a 285 or a um, uh, 285 or a 300 horse. And as you mentioned before, it's got water rudders, and that's downtown, and you can see the bridges down there. That was interesting. The next, the next airplane we're coming up, and I'm 90% sure I'm correct in identifying it, is an aircraft that was built in Detroit, Michigan, and the airplane will be coming up shortly, and it is a Barclay Grove. Uh, if you remember, Dave, there was one of those that flew in the famous Canadian Air Race. Yes. The only time I've ever seen one. 73 or 74? 73 or 4, and that one is now in a museum someplace, and I don't know where it is. And that's a pretty big airplane. It's on a, it's on a 66 9225 90, float, and it had two Pratt Whitney 400 horsepower engines. And to my knowledge, there are only five ever built, and I think only one or two ever went on floats. So this is very, very rare footage, and it's probably, other than unless somebody took a picture of um, the one up in Canada, there's little or no footage of the Barclay Grove on floats. So it's kind of nice to have. The next, the next airplane you'll see coming up is an interesting experience. It was done by TWA, and we'll be coming upon it in just a minute here. And TWA decided they wanted to run a, a connecting flight from Wall Street to LaGuardia. So they could get more business. So they put two Ford Tri-Motors on floats. And there's quite a lot been written about it. And I have a, an extensive article written by an airline captain somewhere. And they put the thing on and they took it down. To, and you'll see it on the ramp downtown. There's the Ford Tri-Motor. And, you know, we, we all watch it at Oshkosh. They're uh, hopping rides. And there used to be one in Ohio that flew out of Sandusky. But there's not many Ford Tri-Motors left flying. And I do, I've never had the honor of ever seeing a Ford Tri-Motor on floats. Uh, this one here has got two Pratt Whitney 400 horsepower engines, and it's on a 66 uh, 9225 float. It's a big airplane, and I think the airplane was um, 
you know, somewhere over around 15,000 pounds. It was a big airplane. Now, all the engines were the same horsepower, all three? All engines were the same horsepower. Okay, you said two, that's why I was wondering. I, I, you're absolutely right, there's three. I, so now you, we're going into New York City? This is New York City, you'll see it going up the ramp. And I think there's a lot of people getting out before we get done. There's a picture somewhere of a lot of people getting out of that yes. airplane. You can see it turning around. Turning around. And it's interesting, that was done by Corvin, you know, the Corvin Korkovsky, who was the chief engineer of Edo, who was a white Russian. He was quite a famous guy. What's a, what's a white Russian? A white Russian who got driven out of Russia when the, when the Tsars took over. And he oh. went on to become a head of, head of hydrodynamic testing at Stevens Institute and was probably considered the greatest authority on... on um, on hydrodynamics and high-speed taxing on seaplanes on water. This is the, Cur the famous bird, Curtis Condor, that went on, and it's an AT-32, and it had two Cyclones, 200 and 715 horsepower engines, and it, had, it was on a 70 float. This airplane went on the Antarctica expedition, took off in the water, landed back on the Antarctica, and was used to ferry supplies back and forth. It became quite a famous airplane. And uh, it was strapped on the ship and flowing down there. And there, was, this is, this is, there were two of these ever built on floats, and this is a Martin YB-10 bomber. And they had floats in the bomb, uh, had, had bombs in the float. And it, it's, uh, it's on a 37, 15,750 float. No, no spreaders in there, too, and I'm not sure if there were bombs in the in the belly of the aircraft or not. And it was evaluated. I don't know why it never went into production. Maybe it was just too much drag from the floats. But that is very rare footage, and I don't think anybody's ever seen that airplane on floats, and two were definitely put together. And again, another good ferry shot. It's, um, Are we back in New York City here? Back in New York City. This is about 1938, 36, 7 or 8, somewhere there, because the Hurricane of 38 took that, that seaplane ramp out. But you can see that air, that ramp had a lot of capabilities because here it's handling an airplane of 15, 16,000 pounds. This is a development contract we got from the CAA with a WACO. And uh, I think it was the Bureau of Aeronautics we did this for. You notice the multiple step. It had a little tailwheel in the stern of the floats. And it was really our first serious effort with amphibious floats. We did do an early uh, Taylor craft on floats, and there is some footage around in one of those films, Dave, that you transferred of it at Speeds Airport. But see the multiple step and see the little wheel in the stern of the thing? And I don't know what really came of the program. I guess there's some flight test reports around, but I'm not sure uh, whatever came of it. And uh, But it was when we were looking at multiple, a lot of people have tried multiple steps, and we found out that if the floats are put on the aircraft and the center of buoyancy and the step is in the proper position, you really don't gain much in aircraft performance with a multiple step. But since to see this, and it's the days when there was development around money to see if you could improve on this. The interesting part of this, we got all this money to see if we can improve on it. And the original design by done by Corvin and uh, under Earl, Earl Osborne was probably the best design we've ever had. And to this day, nobody's invented a better float bottom. Most of the major float manufacturers are now using a compound bottom. It's basically just a direct copy of what Edo is doing today. Is that a J3? That is, it, I think it's a J3, and it's got a three-cylinder engine in it. And the interesting part of that is, and, and anybody who's familiar with the early J3s can tell you what that engine, I can't. But the interesting part to me, and it shows you how light the J3, if you notice he's landing on 1320s, he's landing on the grass. And uh, he taxis around, he stops, he starts to get off the grass. We had a Piper PA-18 that some guy says, oh, you'll have no, no trouble taking it off the grass, and we could not get it off the grass. So the J-3 was light enough we could do it. The next footage I will not really narrate is pretty much self. It's very interesting footage. The Navy has since cleaned this version up, and there is a better story of this. But this is the NC-1 and the famous story of where it went all the way to Portugal. I don't think it's worth me narrating to you, Dave. No, we'll just watch it here and see what, what it happens. And it's, 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 now, one of the things that's interesting to me is on the NC-4, the boat that got wrecked in the Azores, that was under the command of a, of, of a Commander Towers. And I personally knew his son and his grandson. 
and both of them were in aviation. Charlie Towers, his son, was living the last I knew in um, Buford, South Carolina, and owned an airplane. And his other son uh, went to work for an airline and was later killed in an automobile accident. It was very tragic. But this is great footage, and it's very interesting. And somewhere around there is a Navy version of this film that's been cleaned up. As oh, he, but this is the one they wrecked right out here. I think this is right off of Floyd Bennett Field. Is this the one where the guys were sitting on the wing and they had to taxi back in with yeah, the wings? Yeah, that's, that's the NC-4. Okay. That's the land that one that was going to the Azores. And it landed, uh, and they taxied for 24 hours in big, big seas and with a bunch of guys sitting on one wing because they tore off the um, they tore off the wingtip from These were Curtis-built airplanes, and they were originally built, the submarine was just coming in in the First World War, and they were built for long-range submarine patrol on the coast. And by the time the Curtis got them built, and they built four of these mammoth airplanes, um, there is one over in the Pensacola Museum, if anybody wants to go see just a horrendous airplane. And I remember, Dave, they had one down in the... In the um, the mall in Washington, and that's the only time I'd ever seen one. There was one there. And you can see it weighed 28,000 pounds. And the government kind of cheated. You know, they lined up all these cruisers and destroyers and battleships, and they were all within 50 miles of each other, and they had a lot of black smoke coming out. So the navigation was not really as difficult as they made it sound because you just look for the next smokestack, and that would get you there. This is C Commander Towers, who flew the NC-4, the one that got damaged um, off the coast of the Azores and taxied back in. I didn't realize they had ships, smokestacks being a guy. Yeah, they, they, you, know, they were, you know, they had no real nav aids, and there were no beacons. And Can you imagine sitting in that thing for the number of hours it took them to do that, and the noise and the smell and everything else? But I don't think the Navy had too much confidence in the program because, no, they were about 50 miles apart. I guess once you got a couple of thousand feet in the air, you could, you could see the smoke where you came from. And as you know how smoky every ship was doing this, doing World War One and up until World War II. No, Jay, I wasn't around then. No. But you've seen some pictures of the old <laughs> ships with a lot of smoke. Bottom are just coal burning to produce the steam. Oh, okay. So that's where it came from. Do, do you know where these pictures? That's a, where? this is. That looks like the Statue of Liberty in the well, background. But this was all shot at Floyd Bennett Field. Okay. That was a big Navy field, and that's where they took off from was Floyd Bennett. I think that's where NYPD keeps all of their present and that's helicopters. Right. They got the helicopters there, and I think they put a very nice museum in there now. That's being built, and I think it's gotten open to the public, and it's kind of interesting to see. Uh, it's well worth going to, although I've never been to it. I will do that someday. But I think these things had a almost a 48- or 50-foot wingspan that was just gigantic in size. There's a lot of information available if anybody wants to research it on these planes. I didn't do any. Well, offhand, what's the endurance? How many hours can you get? Oh, I think they could run 6 to 10 hours. They carried a lot of fuel, and they carried oh, wow. a cooler. I mean, you know, they... You know, they were big, big airplanes. This is coming up. The only stop. And this is this is the Azores, the volcanic Azores out there. And you'll see some other shops with these shots of the NC-4 taxiing. In is this the one with the torn wing they're taxiing? The torn in? wing. That'll come in. You'll see that a little later okay. here. Where is Reed? See, he was down. And everybody was looking for him. That's absolutely unbelievable that he was ever able to taxi this ship, this thing back into the, uh, in the condition it was in. Now, it taxied uh, where to again? I think it taxied into the Azores, and I think it taxied for 22 hours. I'm not sure. That, but the Navy version of this has very good details. This is the this is the NC-1 that I think that made it all the way. And this is landing there, and the next stop was into Portugal, and you'll see the pictures of that as they progress along. This is it. And all those little mountains in the background are all at one time were active volcanoes. I don't know what they are today. I've never been to the Azores. But certainly interesting footage, and I think this was done. I, they had a date on the front. I think it was 1919 this was done. Oh, right, yeah. old footage, but it's in pretty good shape. Maybe it was NC-4 then was the one that completed the trip. One was the one that was wrecked. At, I don't know what happened to three. And, and, and one is the one that went on. These are the first men that made it across the Atlantic with a number of stops. Well, with this film, that kind of winds up all the footage I have on history. 
Yeah, I, 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 I think, David, we owe you a, a real thank you for all the effort you've made to put this together and to get me shaped up to put it together. And it you know, be sad to see this stuff disappear because uh, this is the only copy left of it. And Edo was not terribly good on taking care of this whole stuff and just, you know, really didn't make no effort to preserve it, which is really too bad. I fished this out of a dumpster, to be honest, is where I got it from. <laughs> well, yeah, I thought you said, oh, here we go. Yeah. This is worth seeing this thing tacked. Uh, this is going to Portugal. This is the one ship that made it all the way. But in a while, you will see the other one coming back into the Azor and the condition of it and, and the amount of fabric that was ripped off the wing. I don't know how they kept it afloat. Must have had a lot of guys to do a lot of bailing. <laughs> We do have coming up some good C-47 footage and some good shots of the Lindbergh trip. <clears throat> this is a little long, but, but again, if somebody really wants to research this, there's a lot of material available, and somewhere in the Navy archives is a very good cleaned-up version of this film that, that can be obtained. I'm not sure where, but I've seen enough of it, so I know it's quite easy to get a hold of. And they towed it in, and they guys must have had a great time when they were over there. Must have had a great party for just making this flight. I can't tell if this is the one or not. No, this is not. You'll see it in a minute here when it comes. Okay. This is when they're still celebrating. I guess the other guys were still taxiing. I think they taxied for 22 hours. This is really an unbelievable story. And I think the Navy says, I think there's some footage in here that says they were up to 35 foot seas. Oh, jeez. How they ever kept this thing together, I'll never That's, know. But. And how'd the guy stay on the wing and not being knocked off? I don't know. I, I really don't know much. Tied about themselves it. to it or something. Yeah, probably tied them down. This is, see, now you can see the old, any kind of Navy ship had a big stack, and was, they were all cold burning, so there's a lot of soot coming out of them. So it was easy to see them for quite a distance out. And then I went from Lisbon, and I went into, I think, Plymouth, England is where these went to. It was really the first transatlantic flight. A little hard to see that against the black there. Yeah, it is. Well, you realize this footage is 80, 90 years old. It's really quite something. Yeah, they did go on to Plymouth. But it's nice to see it, and it certainly documents the, the flight. Well, once we get this into the digital domain, I'll make sure that uh, I make DVDs and data disks of this and get it to three or four people so it's not lost out there. Yeah, I'd like to have a final one, too, just so you can send yep. me one so yep. I have one. Get it done. And the mayor, I guess they made a big scene of it. They had a big party, and they all had a good time. And you can see all the pomp and ceremony in those days and how formally everybody dressed. <laughs> I guess these guys had their uniforms with them in the, in the ships. Well, now it's party time. Yeah, now you're going to have a party. You hit it right on the nose. Well, I guess if you'd done that trip, you'd be partying, too. <laughs> <laughs> if I'd, uh, I'd probably be sick in bed someplace. Yeah, that's right. Here we go. 35 foot seas. Use. The NC-3 was the one, I guess, that taxied okay. in. The NC-4 made it. The one was wrecked, and I don't know what happened to two. You see those guys out there? And they got I just a guy can't on imagine. The there to try to keep it, to keep it balanced. I mean, 35 feet is pretty high. That's pretty high. That's not 35 foot seas there. But no. When you look at the fabric, and there's been some close-up pictures, and all the fabric torn off, it makes you appreciate that's why hard. the thing is incredible. Yes, it's just the point. Three eighth inch. I think that's all wood too, though. Oh, they weren't using aluminum. Three sixteenths, you know, plywood. Oh sure. Yeah. You know, it's a beautiful made. There, the one I saw in Washington, I remember seeing it. It just looked like a mahogany. I can see the fabric pulling off the thing and everything else. How they kept that thing running, I'll never know. And where do you sit? You can't sit on the wing because the fabric's... I guess you stand on the, on the wing tie yourself. bar and hope you stay on there. And tie yourself to it. Yeah, tie yourself to it and hope you don't get drowned. But really, it's quite a remarkable feat of seamanship to get that thing in there. Kind of, kind of a challenge to do. And you can see those guys look pretty gaggled. Pretty, pretty beat up. Yeah, they look beat up as right. Well, it's nice to have this footage. And again, I owe you a, a real thank you for the effort you've done to put all this together. And it's, Otherwise, it all would have disappeared. Some of this is duplicate. We'll try not to narrate it. Uh, most There's a few airplanes in here that are different.
and I get a little information on that. But most of these are similar to what we've seen in the beginning. And Dave can decide whether you want to cut it out or leave it in. Well, I'll take a look at it, and if I can remember... It's yeah. coming up on a Kinner engine. That's kind of a rare airplane. It was, it was identified, so it was the only reason I was able to identify it. Well, if I can remember some of these scenes, if they're duplicated, I'll take them out. But yeah, it's hard to tell. It's, you know, it's starting to look the same now to some degree. Yeah, some are identical, but the first batch we had to get had the label on. That was a great help to me to try to identify them. Well, but, looks, we'll leave it in and let those of you determine if they want to fast forward or something. Yeah, that, it's probably a good point just to fast forward. There's not a great amount, but there is there is one label in here. I could not have get a... Um, this one I think we've had from the beginning, so we've we've got the date on that one. We'll not re-narrate that one. Oh yeah, I remember it. Yeah, and you know, since all these guys are quite formal. One guy gets out of the airplane with a with a jacket and a coat, and another guy they're all wearing ties. The days when people dress considerably different than they do today. Oh, look at Igor Sikorsky. He's flying his test helicopter. He had a tie and suit and a hat on. I remember my father telling me when I got out of college and. 55, he says, you better get yourself a hat because no company's going to hire you if you take a job interview without a hat. <laughs> <laughs> what do they call them now, Fedoros or something? Fedoros or something. There's a ferry, you know, a good shot of the ferry. I think Gorbachev almost had that brought back because they kept talking about his Fedoro. Oh. And again, most of this we've had. I don't know what automated water rudders are. I guess I mean they're connected to the air. You see there. They got you can see the cables on the deck, so there's basically the standard design water rod that everybody's using today. But that was an Edo invention, and I think we held a patent on that for a while. I know we had a patent on the bottom, on the compound bottom design. Well, I remember seeing what's her name, John something, had his avid flyer on the Hudson River with no rod rudders, and he he turned tighter than anything I've ever seen before. Uh, John's uh, nap. John nap, yeah. No water rudder. But Bob then, flies that airplane so well, you think you could do it. Boy, I've never seen a guy who can handle that little airplane that have a flyer as well as he does. And whether it's calm water or rough water, he does a great job of it. Well, the first time I saw him on the Hudson River, the wing was not put on. So I thought he had an accident. The wind to wing broke off. So I landed to help him, and he laughed at me when I said, I thought your wing was broken off. He said, I haven't put it back on yet. <laughs> it's quite an interesting little designer with what he does. Look how fast that rated that is, and I'm sure that's at 16 frames per uh, second. He's, you know, he's got the water rudders down when he landed. Yeah, that's exactly. That's a, that looks like that's an Edo airplane, too. See, some of this footage is a little different, so it's, it's hard to tell what's duplicate and what isn't. We'll, we'll leave it all in. I mean, yeah, I think it's this. This we did have. And if you notice that those days, we didn't see now a float when it's built today. It's built under a technical service order, TSO C-27 that puts out the basic requirements of a float. In those days, there were no design requirements for a float. And in many cases, those early floats were certified under a TC, which was a type certificate. And a lot of them were done under the aircraft type certificate, even though we'd move it around on different airplanes. And it makes it very difficult if you get an antique airplane and you're trying to put one together. The FAA says, well, I want to see the paperwork. And there's no real paperwork on a lot of these pictures we're looking at today. Okay, we saw this before. Yeah, we've seen this before, and this is and some of this I think is the same reel. I didn't know when I picked it up, and I was so scared to run it; it was all going to break. But some of them were identified, and it looks like there's another reel that's not identified. But this has one different airplane in it, and it has a, a label on it because I wouldn't have done it. It's, it's a bird, I think a bird. Okay, I'm not sure of that with a Kinner engine. You'll see it here in a minute. But well, we got some very good footage coming up on the DC-3 and uh, some of the flight test data. Well, I have some still pictures of the DC-3 wrecked, wrecked on a sandbar or something. That was um, uh, that was done over Floyd Bennett Field. Now, uh, this is the, the, the four-place bird airplane, Kinner, the B-5 engine. And uh, this was type third. And it was a, it's a, it was a 125-horsepower engine, that. And that, again, goes back to the letter floats. It was on an M-2665 and then on a 45... Uh, 45 28 float that, again, went on, on some of the early Stinsons and on the um, early Cessna 180s, the old straight tail ones, when they were light and not too high a gross weight. All that is condos now in the background, very expensive real estate. And there's a good shot of the ferry.
and we definitely had this one in the past, so we can you can decide what you want to do with these. Well, because it's the only one there is. Yeah, and, and some of them are slightly different. I don't, you know, I don't know where they all came from, and uh, I think I'll just leave it alone. Yeah. Another good prairie shot. I guess this was all shot in the winter or the fall. The leaves aren't out yet. You well, know, no, that's a good question. When it's cold like that, now water's cold. It'll perform better. Well, yeah, but what happens if something goes wrong? I mean, if there's no rescue boat. How do you get to the guy before he gets hypothermia? Yeah, and no life jackets either in those days. Well, that's right. You know, he wasn't much around or anything. Had a tie and a jacket on, right? That'll, that'll and, well, I guess he puts a tie and tightens it up and hopes it goes quickly. Yeah. Okay. An American era. Thing. Yeah, we had this shot before, but we'll let it we'll let it continue. Well, we do have some pretty good footage tied on the end of this. It's quite rare, so that's well worth looking. You at. know, interesting the hydrofoil shots and what was that? A widgeon on hydrofoils? Uh, the main one, the most of the hydrofoil was all done on a goose. A goose. Okay. What we were trying to do there is we were trying to get an all. Uh, we're beginning to get very nervous about the Russians coming over. You know, we put the dew line in so we could look at them coming across here. So we were looking for an airplane that could operate off all three surfaces, land, water, and snow. So we took a Grumman Goose and we put it on a hydrofoil. We put it on a ski, and then the airplane already had wheels in it. And actually the best takeoff performance of anything was the ski that got us up the quickest. But that hydrofoil footage is wild, and you realize that was all done in the LaGuardia control zone. And that was done in the 50s, 60s, and a little bit, I think, in the early 70s. And there's some pretty good footage of that. I think you have that in that Edo, All the World's film. That's up on the YouTube and the SPA website. But That's you know, in so at the same time, we also tried to improve on the unhealthy uh, characteristics of a widgeon, the bottom design. And we did a lot of experimental work with the length to beam ratio on the bottom. And I think we put three to four bottoms on it. Now, there's a, you can see a good shot of the Edo compound bottom and the stretch skin. Is that what they call a, a, a fluted bottom? That's a fluted bottom. And what it does is it traps air and it runs it back down to the step so you don't get any of that sticking. Now, a lot of people have tried different ways to get it. If you look at a Grumman widgeon or goose, uh, uh, and I think some of one of the float manufacturers up in Minnesota actually takes a hose, a piece of garden hose, and runs it down to the step and brings it up on the deck as a way to stop the suction in the, in the step area. But we found out the fluted bottom was easy to do. It gave better hydrodynamics. Now look at the steep, steepness of that ramp. And boy, when it got slippery. Yep. And there had been some serious accidents on that ramp because people let go. I don't know how that guy gets off with regular shoes and walks up. He knows he wants to get that cigarette in his mouth. <laughs> and again, this is all return footage. Well, let me ask you about that hydrofoil thing. In the film, I, we, we never had any actual photographs of it leaving the water and coming back. Did it ever leave the water? Oh, it, it took off. One of the problems we got with it, and in fact, um, what we did on that thing, is we went on and we decided one of my great ideas, we're going to come up with a cheap float. And we basically take a bunch of Coors beer cans and put them together with no special structures in it. And we put a hydrofoil, and we put it all on a Cessna 150. And we flew it once. And the problem we had... It, it got out of the water pretty good, but the entry speeds became so critical because of the difference in density. How many, I think, uh, what, water's 300 times more dense than air? So if you were one knot fast in entering the water, it would toss you back in the air 20, 30 feet with no flying speed. You had no aileron control. So we all scared ourselves pretty bad with that combination, and we never went ahead with the project. But I do have a few black and white shots. We have no footage of it of flying a Cessna 150 on a hydrofoil. And it was a little bitty foil. I don't think it was eight inches across, and it still had too much lift. If we had a little more money, we would have gone on and done something else with it. But it's time to say, I'm sorry, there was some 8 millimeter shot of it, but I don't know where the 8 millimeter went, and the footage is lost, which is too bad. Because it's probably the only person that ever had a 150 on a hydrofoil. Yeah. Well, I'm glad I kept the VHSs. Uh... And I forgot about them until when they opened a box in the garage and said, oh my gosh, there's all this history. we got to get it out there so everyone can I see I still it. have a couple of ones you taste, but you said you can't do much with them. You want me to send them to you when I get back to Connecticut? I have to see if I can find a one-inch machine first. It'll do it. Any, any of the labs in New York would put it on a display? Well, there's one place in New Jersey that may have it. I have to yeah. I'd make a phone call. Yeah, they got tossed in the Edo. You know, they got tossed in the garbage can, too. I was going to take one home, but the damn machine weighed about 75 or 100 pounds. <laughs> Well, that's yeah. That's what probably the three-quarter inch machine. 
That's a three quarter. Yeah, I don't I, think I've ever seen. I make one inch copies, the three quarter inch, and VHS. Oh. And uh, the one inch would well, the quality of the film wasn't real good in the first place, so I'm not sure we're losing a lot yeah. going to VHS. Now we had this before also. Yeah, and the days of VHS are over now, too. So, well, yeah. This is very interesting now. And the, one of the reasons that Lindbergh's, um, uh, Lindbergh, Lindbergh was a very shy person. He didn't want all the publicity. So he was going to take off either from possibly Floyd Bennett or from Teterboro. And he decided he didn't want all the press around. So he went to Edo. And it was, you know, kind of private property. And then when he came back, he landed there, too. But this is Charles and Ann Lindbergh at the Edo facility, and that's on a Lockheed Cirrus, and that's a YA-6235 float. And this is his first This is his first trip that he took in 1931, so he shows you how old this was. He took the Great Circle trip over northern Canada and went to Russia to China. And the whole story was immortalized uh, by Ann Lindbergh in the book she wrote, North to the Orient. So if anybody ever wants to read that, go obtain that book as well. The airplane was later wrecked in the Yangtze River. I think it got into big waves and it was banging against the ship. And it was brought back to the United States and repaired. Then in 1933, Lindbergh flew again and he went on um, a 29,000-mile uh, survey trip to the coast of North America and South America. And that trip, and that trip was primarily to develop routes for one trip for the um, for, for Pan American Airways. Um, he flew Europe. Africa, South America, and the islands of the Caribbean. And um, all this was taken and shot on the Edo ramp at College Point. Now we're on the DC-3. Yeah, now we've caught the DC-3, and this was the original the original DC-3 footage that was put together. And what happened, when we first got the airplane, we got the floats, and the floats are 40 feet, 41 feet long. And they're 41,000 pounds in displacement. We had no place we could put together, so we went over to... Uh, LaGuardia Airport, which I think was still called South Beach at that point, or North Beach, I guess. And uh, we put the airplane together in the American Airlines hangar at LaGuardia Airport. The airplane then went on to went on to uh, Floyd Bennett Field and did a lot of testing. They developed a requirement. Uh, that they wanted to ferry this thing out of the islands. They wanted to certify it up to a gross weight of 30, 35,000 pounds. And... Um, they were doing a project engineer on that with a Captain Spinney, who later came on and went to work for Edo. And I have talked and had dinner with him on numerous occasions. He's given me a lot of good photographs. Some of the pictures, Dave, you talked about of this thing being wrecked were all produced. And he was actually standing between the pilot and the co-pilot when the thing didn't get off and hit a sandbank. And he really didn't get hurt. The airplane then flipped over the sandbank and started to sink, and they climbed out that escape dome you see on the top. And this is all early water rudder testing, uh, which were all hydraulic, uh, gear retraction testing. And uh, it gets a little boring at times, but it's awful nice to see when you consider this is really probably in the very, very early days of the, of the C-47 on floats, which is probably 1944, 45. Is, um, it, is it true that the main gear is the same that was used on the PBY? Pardon? Is the tire the same tire used on the PBY? No, but I can't. I'm not, I can't confirm that. Could easily be looked at because we do have manuals, and we have the most beautiful manuals written for the government in the days when you probably had 50 guys writing the manuals. We have little pictures of gremlins showing how to unbox the crates and the size. But I think you're correct. It's a PBY tire size. Because when we were at the Greenville Seaplane in Maine, when uh, Max Folsom was flying this, it was sitting on the ground. Somebody commented, "These are the same tires." Uh, used on the PBY, that's why they could get them. Oh, that's probably true. I must say, I'd heard nothing but terrible stories about this. was a terrible airplane. It was da very dangerous. And Max let me fly from the right seat, and he was in the left seat. Cause he, and I never, I'm not type rated in that kind of airplane or anything. And I did a takeoff and a couple of landings. And I turned around and looked in the back, and there were 17 people sitting in the back of it, some of them on the floor and some on chairs. <laughs> and I couldn't get over how well the aircraft performed. It, you know, everybody it had this terrible reputation. It was one that was put in the in the Alaskan CAA after the Second World War. And they flew it around a lot, but they were told never to put it in the water because you can't get it out. And that certainly proved to be all misinformation. There were 100, the original contract was for 150 sets, and we built about 33 sets. And to my knowledge, 13 of them went on, went on the aircraft, 
and five of them were de um, delivered at the Pacific Theater. And they got into Alaska, and they got down as far as Port Mosby in New Guinea, and I have photographs of two of them sitting in Port Mosby. And they were used for some limited uh, medical evacuations on the islands in the Pacific Theater, but I don't think they ever really got into production. They were later um, sold at surplus in Cleveland, and a guy bought them for purely uh, for salvage. He was going to make a towable yacht out of them that you could tow around on the roads and then put it in the water. And um, uh, when he got it all together, he found out it was longer than the legal requirement you were allowed to have over the road. I think then it was 40 feet, and we were 41 feet. So at that point, he cut up all the heavy stuff, the struts and everything, and he kept one set of floats. And everything else disappeared. And that's the set of floats that Edo was going to put together and use as a factory demonstrator. And then when the tough times hit the airline business in the 80s, uh, we gave all the data on to the Folsom's, and they turned around and bought the floats. Weren't they based uh, we in made the struts, and a few other people made the attachment gear and everything else. And they got to give the Folsom's a lot of credit. They put that thing together, and they flew it, and certainly proved successful. It's been to sun and fun a couple of times, and it's been around, and I understand they're in the process of making some, some repairs on it and hope to have it back flying in the next couple of years. Now, didn't those floats come out of Texas? They, they came, came out of Texas. They came out of a junkyard in Texas. Wow. And they've been there the whole time, and all the other ones were cut up. The guy had, he probably had 20 sets or something, and they were truly cut up for scrap. Well, you know, Max did a lot of flying on that, and I listened to some of his stories. <laughs> And my jaw just hangs. I said, Max, why don't you write a book about it? No, you don't want to. Maybe I can talk him into because, it. Because, you know, that, that whole vintage, I remember the first time that I ever went to Greenville, and two things didn't impress me. i never seen big log booms. And they had a, I'm not sure if it's a ship there. What's the name of that little ship now? They hold the uh, Katahdin? On, they give the rides. The Katahdin? Katahdin. Katahdin. And I'm not sure it was the Katahdin, but they had these ships dragging these gigantic long, long log booms. They looked a mile long, up and down the lake. And then the environmentalists get into it, and they forbid that because it was putting the tannic acid in the water. And I must say, Moosehead Lake used to be very dangerous to fly in because there were so many, um, what do you call the heads, log heads? Or dead heads. heads. Yeah, sticking out of the water. Yeah, dead heads. Dead heads, dead heads. And uh, I remember that. And the other thing I remember, and I remember to this day because I counted the number of airplanes, right there in that Greenville Bay, not, not including, in fact, I didn't even know where uh, Greenville Junction was at that point. There were 43 seaplanes, including a Beaver and a Beach 18. And I don't think there's six left there today, which certainly tells you what's happened to the seaplane in the north. Well, there's a film on YouTube and on the SPA website of flying the DC-3. Fortunately, Bob Murray had a camera the day that we're doing the flying, and so he was able to video a lot of this DC-3 with Max... Uh, uh, flying it. In fact, the day we went to start it up at the airport, the batteries were dead, and they had to haul, tow on a cart, a bunch of truck batteries up about two miles from the junk, from the seaplane base up to the airport. And there was just enough juice, so Max actually got it going on a half-dead battery. Got one engine going, then got the other one going. Yeah, huh? right. I know. Uh, so there's good footage. Been kind of casual on these things, but he makes it for a very exciting ride. Well, he talks about, I think he said something about one gear came down and one didn't. Right. And they decided it was safer to land on the water than on the land. And uh, when the one hit with the wheel, they did a 90-degree turn. Uh, a lot of water over the windshield, but it didn't flip over. And they know now that you can land it with the gear down on one side, and it'll just make a sharp turn. I can't, <laughs> I can't imagine how sharp that was. Yeah, I'm not sure I want to do that again. I, I remember telling him another story, too. They lost the heater going down, and they had all their family and wives and everything with them. And it all, it got very cold, and they finally landed, I think, in some very short runway in the Carolinas. Max always made for an exciting trip. Well, and I said, I hope they get that back together, and I'd love to see it get to Oshkosh. It was too bad it didn't make it this year for the, you know, they had the 40 um, DC-3s there, C-47s. Well, I'd hope that Fantasy of Flight there would buy it for their museum. That would be a great place for it to go to. And Fantasy of Flight has certainly become a very, very um, enthusiastic um, seaplane facility. You know, and he's going to build a equivalent of a Pan Am um, seaplane facility in there, and he hopes to have it done the next couple of years. He's got that big Sutherland. He's got a couple of Grumman Ducks. And he's in the process now of taking a Stinson Volte, which is a rather large 4,000-pound displacement airplane. It was an observation airplane at the end of the war that was put on amphibious floats by Edo in Model 77. 
and he hopes to have that thing flying in the next year or two. So he's got some very interesting seaplanes down there, and he does that spectacular seaplane outing at the Sun and Fun Time, and it's a great pleasure to go to. I Jay, hope you make it this year, Dave. Let me interrupt you, Jay, because we've got about a minute to go, and the film runs out. Uh, thank you for doing all the research and taking the time to talk on the phone from Florida so we can get this up on the uh, YouTube, on the SPA site, and all the other aviation websites. This is a piece of history that nobody would know about if you hadn't taken the time to research it and tell us about it. And I thank you for doing that on behalf of all of us who are interested in seaplane flying. Well, thank you for that. But the key thing was that you made the effort to put this together. And, and the other thing was people aren't really seeing. I gave this to you an awful lot of bits and pieces, and you've done a lot of slicing and a lot of effort to put it together in the shape it's in today. And we owe you a great a great thank you for all you've done and all you've done for the world of seaplanes, including starting the SPA and what it's meant to all of us. It's been an important part of our life. And well, the SPA... I think this is Floyd Bennett. I'm not sure. I think it was. We saw him take off. Well, the SPA made this all possible, and it's doing great things for people interested in seaplane flying. And for those who are not members, uh, we certainly ask you to go to the website and consider joining. We'll put the ad address here on the screen here in about five seconds. And go look at the website. Thanks, Jay. Talk to you later. And I'll talk to you later. And I guess we're all done then, huh? Yep.